Welcome to this uh, virtual session of Atlantic Dialogue. This year's session is devoted uh, to uh, uh, the wider Atlantic rebuilding pathways to recovery. And uh, this, uh, the, the present session will focus on the following topic, the Biden administration rebuilding pathways with wider Atlantic. Uh, to, uh, to share with us their thoughts and their insights, uh, we, uh, the Policy Center of the New South, invited the following eminent uh, uh, experts uh, Mr. Bruno Tertraïs, Deputy Director de la Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique. France, uh, Ian Lesser, Vice President, Foreign Policy Executive Director of the German Marshall Fund, and Fernanda Maniota, Senior Fellow of uh, uh, the Center, the Brazilian Center for Inter uh, International Relations. Uh, we all know that uh, the Biden uh, Matra America is back was interpreted as a message to the European Union, to NATO membership, to the United States competitors and adversaries, and to the rest of the world that you, the United States is back with a different style and renewed commitment, renewed commitment to favor diplomacy over confrontation, multilateralism over unilateralism, and democracy and human rights over dictatorship. The Biden administration delivered um, its promises uh, a few weeks after acting the return of the United States to WHO to the, the presentation of the candidate to the Human Rights Council, the return to the Paris Treaty, the return to the CPO negotiations. At the same time, uh, uh, Biden administration is seeking areas of convergence with Russia, particularly on arms control, to achieve what's called strategic stability. And the meeting in Geneva last June uh, led to a joint statement uh, in which it was announced that two working groups were created on arms control and risk reduction measures. As far as US-China uh, relations are concerned, the virtual summit of the 15th of November, 2021, was meant to smoothen the relation between the two countries and to uh, avoid the escalation of the existing or the pending dispute and try to ease the tension between the two countries. Of course, uh, the three T's, Taiwan, technology, and trade, uh, remain as, uh, as fuelers of US-China disputes. But at the same time, during the COP27, we heard that uh, uh, the two countries, and it was a very uh, uh, welcomed uh, surprise that the United States and China uh, concurred uh, to accelerate emission reduction toward the Paris Agreement goals of 1.5 Celsius and uh, uh, to share a policy and technology development. In view of the of the above, we I would like to share with you a few questions that uh, that are only indicative in order to uh, uh, structure our discussions. And these questions are the following: How can the Biden administration view the transatlantic partnership, which will lead to formulating a common strategy toward China, reimagining NATO, and the in the US-EU partnership. Will Biden, two, will Biden agenda threaten European strategic autonomy? And three, what are the prospects for an inclusive Atlantic policy of alliance that takes into account 
the wider Atlantic community. And finally, looking at the wider Atlantic, all their signs of close transatlantic parliamentary cooperation between the European Parliament, the US Congress, the Latin American Parliament, and the African Union Parliament. These are just, as I said, indicative few questions that I hope will, uh, will guide our, uh, our friendly conversation. I, mean, I would like to call it a friendly conversation. Uh, I will begin by giving the floor to uh, Bruno uh, Tertarais, Deputy Director of the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique. Please go ahead, uh, Bruno. Well, thank you very much, Mohamed. It's a pleasure to be back with uh, the Policy Center for the New South, even if it's virtually. But it's particularly appropriate, given the topic we're going to talk about, because if anything, many of us in Europe, and certainly the French, tend to have a very parochial uh, uh, vision of transatlantic relation. Uh, for us, when we use this expression, most of the time, it would be relations between Europe and the United States, period. Whereas, as you know, and certainly uh, one knows very much in the framework of the Atlantic Dialogue, it's a, it should be a much broader conversation. So with this caveat in mind, May I offer a few remarks seen from the French standpoint, I guess. I'm not speaking here, of course, as a representative of all French views, but I guess that it's unavoidable to have a little French uh, uh, prism when, when discussing these uh, issues from Paris. Uh, I think one year after the, uh, the election of Mr. Biden, uh, two things are clear from my standpoint. Is that there used to be two narratives about the Biden administration, uh, a German narrative and a French narrative, and they are both wrong. Uh, the French narrative was as follows. Uh, the US is leaving Europe anyway, uh, so it does not really matter whether it's Biden or Trump or anyone else. Uh, the US is leaving Europe. I think this French narrative has proven wrong. Uh, the Biden administration has maintained forces uh, significant uh, military forces in Europe. It still has a lot of European of economic interests in Europe and uh, has uh, given uh, uh, signs of its willingness to rejuvenate NATO. So I think that uh, this overall French narrative is not very convincing. But then there was a uh, uh, there was a, another narrative, which is to say, uh, and I call it the German narrative, that with the Biden administration, everything would be back on track. Uh, and that's not correct either, uh, because the U.S. has piloted to Asia. Uh, it's a fact, and now it's uh, in dispute. It's uh, hard to dispute, even much more than it was the case uh, 10 years ago. Uh, when you ask uh, the U.S. administration, who is your most important ally, they used to reply Germany, and now they reply Japan. So the, the pivot to Asia... Uh, is a fact. Uh, I've even heard that the, uh, the new president of the German Marshall Fund, uh, before she was elected, actually right before, uh, saying that the US is no longer a European power, uh, which is something that uh, surprised those of us who were used to our US colleagues describing their country as a European power, as de facto European power. As many of you know, uh, there was a very unpleasant episode um, around mid uh, around mid September uh, for uh, French American but also French British and French Australian relations. The announcement, the surprise announcement of a new trilateral partnership in the Indo-Pacific called AUKUS. And even though this is not the topic of our conversation today, the fact that uh, it was announced with uh, very little attention to the kind of reactions it would create in Europe, in France in particular, is also a testimony to the fact that the, the pivot is real. But there is a silver lining to this pivot. My contention, and I'll be happy to discuss that with Ian and other colleagues, is that because the China priority is so high on the Biden administration agenda, there is also a real willingness not only to uh, close ranks, but also to compromise on some uh, uh, contentious transatlantic uh, issues, such as trade in particular. And it seems to me, and this is what I would submit, this is, it seems to me that uh, because its priority is China, uh, the, the US administration 
uh, does not want to, wants to minimize as much as possible uh, conflicts and disputes with European countries. And of course, and that, although that's a separate conversation, minimize the risk of a conflict in Europe in which it would uh, become uh, embroiled. And that's the problem, I guess, the events in Russia and around Ukraine and uh, around Russia and around the European Union are showing us that perhaps this pivot to Asia is seen by some actors on the European landmass as an opportunity for them. So I guess it would be uh, difficult for the Biden administration to uh, walk and chew gum at the same time, as they say in the United States, that is, uh, to focus on Asia while not completely forgetting about, uh, about Europe. Meanwhile, uh, we in French see uh, our drive for strategic autonomy of Europe uh, more justified than ever because of the pivot to Asia. Uh, but we emphasize the fact that we're not doing that against NATO. We're also doing that for the sake of the transatlantic alliance. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, allowing the Europeans to be a bit more responsible for their own defense and security uh, is something that is worthwhile also for the United States because whatever additional defense and security capabilities the uh, Europeans build will also be useful uh, for NATO. There are only there is only one set of forces in Europe, national forces. They can be used nationally with Europe or with uh, the uh, the United States. But this concept of strategic autonomy is not only directed at the United States. Uh, it's also directed at any other major power. Uh, Europe does not want to be uh, too dependent on uh, uh, a major power, be it the United States, but also China or Russia. And I think in the coming uh, weeks and months, we will see uh, uh, increased discussions with Washington on uh, on the need for uh, on the uh, uh, the scope of this strategic autonomy, on the level of conversation. Uh, we should have with uh, our American friends on these issues. And also, perhaps most importantly, on the kind of action we want to have together or not in the in the Pacific. Uh, most of us in Europe do not want to participate in a Cold War with China. But then equally, most of us recognize that Europe cannot afford to stay aloof uh, as the tensions in the uh, uh, Pacific region rise. So we will not want to form a bloc with the United States to come from China, but we, we, cannot, we cannot afford to stay away from the uh, uh, rapidly accelerating uh, US-China uh, competition. This is why, this is where actually the Arcus uh, uh, incident, shall we say, uh, was a, maybe not a blessing in disguise, but at least as a silver lining, because uh, there, has, there is now an agreement between the EU and the United States to have not only uh, more transatlantic discussions on security, which is something new for the EU, relatively new, but also uh, a, spe a specific discussion on uh, uh, European and American interests in the Indo-Pacific and how we can maybe not coordinate, but at least articulate, articulate our strategies uh, in the uh, in the region. So overall, I see uh, transatlantic relations today under the Biden administration um, as being certainly better than under the Trump administration, but um, not necessarily being a bed of roses uh, because um, we will uh, continue as Europeans to have a slightly different or not tot not totally identical interest with our with our American friends. Perhaps I should stop here unless you would like me to continue. I think we, we were asked to do some short initial presentation. Mohamed? Thank you, Bruno, for uh, your very brief but excellent presentation. I, I'm, re I'm, happy to, I'm happy to continue if needed. Let, of just course. let me know. Uh, uh, you had exactly, because I have my chronometer on, you had exhausted exactly seven minutes, 22 seconds. I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a very good precedent. You set a very good precedent. But I'm, I'm assuming that this is the only the first part of your discussion, and we will come back to you. So uh, uh, please, Jan, if you can, uh, if you can take over, and uh, I, I'm not limiting your time. 
Mohammed, thank uh, you I don't much. have I, uh, I don't want to have problems with Brussels. We have enough already. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not to, not to worry. Um, thank you very much. I mean, you know, um, lots of things that Bruno said that I completely agree with. Uh, but above all, you know, a, a pleasure to be with you, even if it's not in person in Marrakesh. Uh, but look, I will say something at the end about the wider Atlantic, because I think that's worth thinking about. In other words, not just this, this sort of classical framework of the US and Europe, uh, but let me let me save that for my third point. Really, just three three points to share with you. The first is that, and you sort of anticipated some of this, Mohammed, in your introduction. I mean, President Biden is probably the most foreign policy minded American president since George H. W. Bush, which is the elder Bush, um, and uh, he's Atlanticist by experience, by formation, and this is true for much of his foreign policy uh, team, actually. Um, even if they have other positions, even if they're dealing with Asia or Latin America, most of them came out of a kind of uh, European affairs, Atlanticist formation. And, and I think that counts for something. And, and there's a lot of damage to be repaired. I mean, it is extraordinary that some of these tensions, of course, were already there under, you know, going back to the Bush administration, at least some of them are historic. But Trump, you know, in a, in a very special way, made things worse. Uh, the erosion of trust erosion of trust at the public level, but the also, also the erosion of trust in an elite level across the Atlantic, I would say around the Atlantic Basin actually, was very, very marked. And so there's a lot of uh, repair to be done. Um, and you know, I think Biden is doing his best to do it. Um, he has huge domestic distractions, like most administrations around the world. Um, and that, that has something to do with his approach. Um, there is also a question of, you know, how far uh, he can go, um, you know, with this sort of foreign policy that benefits the middle class in mind. Now here, you know, I sort of hear echoes of the kind of thing that President Macron talks about when he talks about a foreign policy, a Europe, a France that protects. I mean, it's really, frankly, not so much different. And so there are elements of this economic nationalism, especially economic nationalism, you know, it's not just that, uh, that actually hold over from the Trump administration but the style is completely different. And I wouldn't dismiss this because the style at a certain level does become the substance. Um, I think you certainly will have what most Atlantic partners would like, which is a more predictable America, but it's not always gonna be an agreeable America. That's true. I mean, I, I very much agree with the, the point that Bruno has made about this, but on many policy fronts, very real and important ones uh, on, on climate, on health, on human rights, on Russia, mostly on China, mostly. Um, there is a strong degree of convergence, I would say, around the Atlantic at this point. Uh, burden sharing, especially within NATO, Bruno talked about this. Any American administration is going to come with that message. Uh, this administration comes with the message too. They want Europe to spend more and do more. Um, <laughs> the question is the style, but also how you measure it. And I do think it's true that this administration shows every sign of measuring it in a less orthodox way. You know, what is a contribution to transatlantic uh, security and defense burden sharing? Uh, it can be measured in different ways, and it's not only about how many, what the percentage of defense spending is, it's about many, many other things, and we can talk about that. Uh, and as things, some non traditional issues like well, let's mention health security for one come into play. There are lots of contributions that countries can make to this. But at the end of the day, I think the United States is gonna be completely comfortable with more strategic autonomy from Europe if it encourages Europe to spend more and do more. I think that's basically where the center of gravity is. So what is what are America's partners concerned about? <laughs> and they're certainly concerned. I sit here in Brussels and um, you know whether it's the French view or the the German view, I complete, it's a very clever formulation. I completely agree with it. Uh, they're both wrong in a sense. There's also a Brussels view. So let me try maybe to give you the Brussels view, which of course neatly combines the anxieties everyone holds. Um, and I would, I would put them this way. First of all, it's a, it's a fear that there is this economic nationalism light that you will see that persists from the Trump years. We'll have to see where that goes. Um, there's a question of political durability. Uh, yes, Biden, uh, great. How long will a Democratic uh, 
administration last in the United States. We have midterm elections coming up. That will be very significant. Uh, in 2024, we'll have a presidential election. Um, I don't think Europe can be complacent about the outcome there. I mean, would Trumpism could well outlast Trump, even if Trump himself doesn't come back. Uh, the broader question of a geopolitical shift, uh, this is high, hotly debated, obviously. Uh, no question. In this sense, you know, Trump talked about China as number one, Russia as number two when it came to strategic priorities. The same would be true for this administration. Everything else is a sort of distant third. I mean, that said, I think there is a certain mythology about American disengagement from key areas uh, in Europe, in the Mediterranean, in the Middle East. Uh, there isn't actually that much evidence of this uh, in the Gulf a little bit, but some other places, Afghanistan, obviously. But if you look broadly at the periphery of Europe, you don't really see this. So we can come back to that if you'd like. Um, but the big question, of course, is this, this pivot to the Indo-Pacific. It's there. There's no question. The question is, is it going to be fast or slow? Uh, even if it's slow, we may be coming eventually to the end of a hundred year American pivot to Europe which are over 100 years now, American pivot to Europe in strategic terms. But there are things that could happen in Asia that would greatly accelerate that trend. Things can go wrong next week in the South China Sea or over Taiwan, uh, which would change this very, very rapidly with implications for everybody. Um, third, last point. Um, you know, there is not in the American, I, I, I love the wider Atlantic frame, and I love the idea of changing our mental maps about transatlantic relations. Um, I do think it has a certain traction in intellectual circles, and it probably should have more. Uh, but certainly, American policy is not made that way. We, you'll search in vain for anything labeled the wider Atlantic in the State Department or, or the Defense Department, just as you will search in vain for anything labeled the Mediterranean, by the way. So, uh, But that doesn't mean that there aren't the regional engagements to be balanced here. And I do think this administration is more inclined uh, to look at a wider set of partners around the Atlantic than some of its predecessors. Um, for very practical reasons, uh, in many ways, uh, if you're going to deal with the global health crisis, you're going to have to deal with the global south. Uh, if you're going to have to deal with the future of trade, you're going to have to deal with the global south. <clears throat> Migration, we could make a very long very, very long list. Where will it get more difficult? It'll get more difficult over things like democracy promotion or, or anti-corruption, where this administration has a particular focus. It's almost an ideological focus for them, I would say. Um, and that's not going to be comfortable for Brazil, for example, at least for this government in Brazil. We could talk more about, or, but to some extent with Mexico as well. We could talk more about all of that. A very final point I would leave you with. We're talking about uh, big picture, high politics made by governments but seen from the United States, you know, in a way, the United States has multiple international policies. If you sit in Miami or you sit in Los Angeles, the world looks rather different. And much of that does look south. I mean, in some ways, Miami is the capital of Latin America. We know this. There are 12 flights a day to Brazil, or there used to be. Um, this is a factor, too, I think, when America's partners look at the United States. So I would argue maybe, you know, for a more diverse view about this. We had a French and a German view and a view from Brussels. Maybe there should also be a view from Miami. Mohammed, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jan. And I, uh, like, like your predecessor, Bruno, you raised some. some I, I, I noted so at least two questions that I will pose to both of you when we finish, just to uh, to continue this very exciting uh, discussion, but for, for the time being, let me let me turn to uh, uh, Fernanda Maniota, uh, our friend from Brazil. I hope that she will uh, bring some sunshine to this debate. Also, please go ahead. Thank you, Ambassador, and hello, good morning to everyone. It is a great honor to be here representing the Brazilian Center for International Relations where I am a senior fellow responsible for the United States program. I would like to thank you uh, to thank the Poly Center for the New South for this kind invitation. And also would like to share that I'm very impressed by uh, how you put, put together such an impressive agenda. So congratulations. Uh, I would like it's, to uh, share- it's Jan, it's Jan who inspired us uh, with Bruno 
of, of the whole agenda. We just uh, uh, put it, uh, we structured the, the ideas of our two colleagues. Wow, amazing. So uh, to address the discussion of this panel, uh, I believe we need to ask ourselves, what does Biden represent? And some of the thoughts I would like to share here, they are very uh, similar to what Bruno and Dr. Lester just, uh, just mentioned. Uh, I think the first thing we must uh, keep in mind is that Biden means more than a simple return to the old normal in the US to use this uh, very popular, popular expression nowadays. Uh, and this is real for two reasons. Uh, from an international point of view, of course, Biden wants to restore the American commitment to the liberal border, reconnect to the uh, uh, with the allies, especially, of course, the European ones. And uh, he aims to reinforce the government's multilateral agenda. But at the same time, we must keep in mind that uh, there is, from a domestic point of view, uh, the willing not just to stabilize the country in the face of multiple crises, but also uh, to promote a significant, uh, significant structural change. So uh, Bruno just mentioned that uh, there is somehow um, a, a sense of priority, priority re regarding China and the pivot to Asia. I would add that besides Asia, we have here a uh, 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 a dispute between the international agenda and the domestic agenda that in this particular moment is very relevant to the outcomes and to what Biden can give in terms of uh, results. My hypothesis, uh, given this scenario here, is that the sensitivity and the, tra the, transfer the transformational character of the domestic agenda must somehow eclipse the external agenda. Uh, so if the internal reformism of the government is the model of the legacy that Biden wants to leave, we can expect a strong trend to look inside. And when we uh, pay attention to what Biden has uh, been reinforcing during the last months, we always see the same topics, the same five topics. So inequality, diverse, diversity, immigration, environment, arms policy. And somehow it means that uh, other regions of the globe can be relega relegated to sporadic policies or not so central measures in the government agenda. It means that after a period of relative distancing and skepticism with Trump, perhaps Europe has exaggerated its expectations of what Biden, Biden can do. And I say that, uh, of course, not being European and from a perspective uh, of outside. Uh, Biden uh, needs to invest political capital to pass his most important, important government project, which of course is the project Build Back Better. We are all following in the Congress these discussions. And at the same time, the control of the pandemic in the United States, the control of inflation and the public debt, they monopolize the attention at the White House. And at the same time, Biden's popularity is the lowest rate, is it, is it, is it now, in the lowest rate since the beginning of the government. And as uh, Dr. Lester just mentioned, we must keep in mind that in 2022, uh, we have leg legislative electoral year in the US. So uh, uh, at the same time, furthermore, Biden has a red sign that he can be very pragmatic and even unilateral in defending the American interests, even in the face of the European partners. So not just maybe it's not a pri priority, but at the same time, uh, it can be uh, uh, sometimes very uh, tensions as well. Two recent examples uh, reinforce this idea. The first one is uh, the way out of Af Afghanistan that was mentioned before. Uh, Biden didn't accept changing the deadline for eviction uh, while the other G7 countries called for a postponement of the de deadline. He didn't agree on that. 
Uh, and at the same time, if Donald Trump, his predecessor, negotiated a deal with the Taliban without taking, uh, without talking to the European partners, Biden uh, continued with the withdrawal plans, uh, downplaying NATO's role, and also um, failing to consult the allies. Uh, there was no main mention uh, of multilateral coordination in the first speeches made by the president of the US after the onset of the crisis. And the second example is that um, uh, Bruno just mentioned as well about the AUKUS agreement. Uh, the French foreign minister even referred to that agreement as a step in the back by the United States, because of course the Americans, uh, the Americans went through negotiations between France and Australia, and led the European country, which is an ally, uh, to lose a contract for the construction of conventional uh, submarines estimated uh, at five billion Australian dollars. Just to give you uh, the proportion, but of course, calm down. I promise I won't be overly pessimistic. Despite this, of course, there are transatlantic opportunities. And to finalize here, I would like to mention uh, three of them that I consider the most relevant for this debate. The first one is to uh, mention that Biden is important from a symbolic and practical point of view for the defense of democracy in the continent and for the project of the European integration. Biden is relevant for straightening responses to radicalism on the continent and abroad and the wider uh, Atlantic as well. Uh, at the same time, the Biden government represents a new opportunity uh, to rethink NATO. Uh, and now, without the pressures and the threats typically uh, imposed during the Trump era. The second opportunity uh, in terms of this transatlantic partnership is that Biden, by placing the green agenda as a focus uh, of its diplomacy, its, econ its economy, uh, he reinforces a set of values already defended by the Europeans for years. And uh, by that, he creates incentives for the international dissemination of this new practice across the globe. At the same time, Biden, I believe, create new business opportunities uh, that are focused on innovative companies on modernizing action that addresses the, con uh, the concern with the climate crisis and allow the expansion of clean energy. And uh, the third point, the last one, is that the Biden government is interested in coordinated action with the Europeans to, obtain, to, to contain uh, Russia and China as uh, uh, both of Bruno and uh, Dr. Lester uh, mentioned before. Uh, First, because of technology and the security dil dilemmas that are in the heart of the mutual concerns. Uh, but I would say that more than that, because uh, these two players, the US and the European Union, they must uh, find a way to handle with a challenge that will be faced. On the one hand, the United States and Europe are seeking to invest in a postmodern agenda uh, based on free market, climate change, cybersecurity. But on the other hand, powers such as Russia and China, they reinforce the urgency of traditional geopolitical issues, such as no intervention uh, in territorial integrity and the consolidation of regional power uh, arrangements. So US and Europe need to gather to find a way to handle it. And this is also about strategic uh, autonomy. So with these provocations and uh, these quick reflections, I end my first intervention, but I'm uh, fully available to participate in the debate and to answer the questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernanda. Anyway, we, uh, we expect you to uh, be extremely active in the uh, remaining time that was allocated to us. Uh, let, me, let me begin by raising just a few questions that came to me when I was listening to, uh, to, to all of you. Uh, first of all, about the wider Atlantic. Uh, I, I think for the last 40 or 45 minutes, we have had a very Eurocentric discussion. Uh, it, it, it was mainly about, uh, about Europe, 
uh, and the United States, and it was mainly about Europe and the United States in the, in, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I haven't heard about the word of Africa, uh, and uh, neither the word of the Middle East, and I think that uh, both uh, 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 have, uh, have, I think, uh, certain importance when it comes to uh, the, current, uh, uh, the current situation. To, to Bruno, I, I had one, one question, I think, or maybe two. The first one, do you think that the, uh, after the, uh, do you think that the French-United uh, States relations were uh, repaired only by this uh, contact between Macron and uh, President Biden and the discussion between Blinken and the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of France? And secondly, when it comes to uh, the security and defense strategy of Europe, I think uh, what, what comes to mind is this uh, uh, split in the European Union between the former uh, Eastern and Central European countries, and let's say the pioneers of the European Union, uh, and, uh, and how about Turkey? Uh, Turkey is not in this uh, scheme of uh, European security, and uh, I mean we all know the, the the importance of the role of Turkey in in uh, in NATO. So these are all two questions uh, to Bruno, but uh, it's it's up to my two other colleagues to uh, to intervene to uh, to add to our uh, discussion. Yeah, I'm happy to take all those questions. But before I do, Mohammed, if I may, very quickly, three uh, three quick points. Uh, listening to listening to my colleagues uh, Ian and Fernanda, um, first of all, I think it's entirely normal that a country, be it the United States, Brazil, France, or Morocco, focuses first on its domestic agenda. This is what presidents and prime ministers and governments are elected for, and I think this is what the United States usually does, unless it's facing an a an existential threat or a threat pursued as such, be it the Soviet Union during the Cold War or Al Qaeda during uh, during a few years. So uh, I think this is a reality we should uh, all live with. Uh, second, uh, Ian said, you know, what happens if there is a major conflict in Asia? I think he's absolutely right. But I have an additional question: What happens if there is a major conflict in Europe? I mean, I don't think that Russia is going to fully invade Ukraine tomorrow. But what if there was a very severe crisis? What would it mean for the future of the US engagement in, uh, in Asia? Now, concerning uh, your points, Mohammed, um, I think what's happening in Africa and to some extent in the Middle East is the proof that there can be, there can be a continuation of very good transatlantic cooperation with our American friends, at least um, a, between France and the United States. It's, uh, a cooperation in Africa at this point continues very well. I think that if there are problems in the Sahel, it's uh, the, uh, the the French-American cooperation is not the problem. Uh, uh, are, as you know, Mohammed, very well, uh, much uh, we have a much uh, bigger problem. And to answer your question in particular, I would say uh, that, yes, the French have tried to make the best of a crisis that was very severe, and it was not a financial, it was not a, about the contract. This was a breach of trust. Uh, this is what where, where, where it was so fundamental. And I think we've been trying to make the best of it by rejuvenating the French-American agenda uh, in a sense that is positive and uh, beneficial to uh, transatlantic relations in general. And I think the Biden administration has played along. They have recognized that they made a mistake and they've, uh, they've played along. So we're on a much better track uh, on, that, uh, from, on that respect. Um, I think that more, more or less in France, we decided to uh, to uh, uh, punish Australia, uh, well, ignore Australia, punish Britain, and uh, and forgive the United States, as they used to say in the US uh, about France in 2002. Uh, finally, concerning the uh, East-West split in Europe, I mean, yeah, it's um, there is an East-West split, which from my standpoint is more problematic for our respective conceptions of democracy than for our own respective perceptions of security. Because we can bridge on the security front, but uh, the uh, political dynamics um, are indeed posing problems to the very foundations of the European Union. As far as Turkey is concerned, 
I would say that, um, of course, Turkey is a very important member of NATO, but uh, I think the, the question is should be put to Turkey more to more than the uh, EU, EU members. I mean, the question is, do you still want to be a member of the Western liberal family, or have you made a different strategic choice? If you have made a different strategic choice, are there conclusions we should draw uh, from um, from the way the Atlantic Alliance operates or even exists? This is a sort of question, by the way, that uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron was asking, but he was uh, complaining that uh, there was a risk of the Atlantic Alliance becoming uh, brain dead. I'm not saying that Turkey is the problem and that the EU is the solution, but this would require much broader conversation. I may leave it at that at, at this point, so, Mohammed. Could you repeat your question? I think you might have been on mute. Am I? Am I readable now? Yeah. Uh, what I said is that uh, I've always maintained that the uh, the the Turkish foreign policy uh, made uh, made uh, almost a U-turn because it's out of frustration because the negotiations between Europe. European Union and uh, and uh, and Turkey were stalled, and there was uh, a yet to the uh, admission of of Turkey. So to Turkey did not have any alternative but to uh, uh, completely forget about this option and uh, try to to uh, conduct another foreign policy with the no problem with the, all the neighborhood with implication involvement in different parts of the world including uh, close to, to Morocco and, and Algeria and the, our, uh, uh, our part of the world. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's the point that I want to make uh, immediately after what you said. And uh, to, uh, to, to Jan, you remind, when we talked about uh, is uh, Biden point of policy a continuation of Trump, you remind me of uh, uh, a statement made by Farid Zakaria in one of his uh, uh, GPS uh, programs. He said, if, 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 if Biden continues his current course, historians might one day look back on him as the president who normalized Donald Trump's foreign policy. Well. Yeah. Back to you, Jan. That's another way of putting it. Uh, and I understand what he means by that. I mean, and we got at a bit of this in our conversation earlier, that if you look at the sort of grand strategic problems out there, the world brings things to you and uh, forces internally that are uh, driving a, a, a kind of, uh, well, whether you want to call it economic nationalism or a foreign policy for the middle class or a foreign policy that protects you know, are, are evident in the United States, but they're also evident in many other places. And, and so there are, there's a structural thing going on here, uh, which, which tends to support that, that case. I mean, that said, again, I, the style is completely different. The, uh, the tendency to take institutions, especially multilateral institutions, uh, seriously, which is, which is very much a mark of this administration. Whether they do it well in every case or not, this is another issue. But their inclination is highly multilateral. Um, this was not at all the case for the Trump administration, who is actively opposing um, things that were seen as kind of emblematic of the foreign policy elite and its projects and its alliances and its trade agreements and all of those things. So in that sense, I think there is, a, is really a departure. I mean, but what I would say, and I want to say a word about Turkey, but what I would say is that what really um, is driving, you know, is a, is a hallmark of the environment now, which is shared, I would say, around the Atlantic Basin, is this growing accumulation of risk that, you know, for all of the recognition of the need to have at least stable, if not agreeable, stable relationships with China or with Russia, um, things go wrong. Things go wrong and misjudgments are made, brinkmanship happens, things go out of control. And, and this is very, very dangerous, it seems to me. And it does bring us to Turkey because in Turkey's neighborhood, uh, I would say um, 
exacerbated by Turkish policy in recent years, uh, there has been this accumulation of risk with Greece and others, Cyprus, others, Egypt in the Eastern Mediterranean, also with France at a certain point. Um, how do you interpret this in Turkey? It's a kind of you know, preference for a sort of non-alignment. And that's all very well and good if you're living in a risk-free, safe environment, uh, when it was all about trade and political engagement in the region. But it's not just about that anymore. It's about a lot of other things. Um, and uh, you know, there has been a complete collapse, I would say, as we're talking about the Biden perspective, a complete collapse of, um, of uh, the strategic constituency for Turkey in Washington. It's Republicans, Democrats, a lot, a lot that Republicans and Democrats agree on these days. This is one thing they all agree on, that Turkey has gone off the rails, that is becoming an unreliable partner. Uh, it's an important partner, but an increasingly unpredictable and unreliable one. And uh, you know, increasingly, that would be the view in Wall Street as well, given what's happening uh, to the Turkish lira and the, the management of fiscal policy in Turkey. Um, it's, it's becoming a very, very difficult partnership for Europe and the United States. My question to Jan, do you think it's uh, uh, Turkey is unreliable because it's becoming non-aligned? Because it's somewhat, it's, it's trying to really uh, be extremely pragmatic, uh, playing with Russia when it is, it serves its interest, I while would, being really yeah. attached to NATO and to the United States relations, etc. It's a very good question. You know, look, uh, you know, Turkey is is a complex place. It's very often said of Brazil. Well, Brazilian friends would tell you all the time that Brazil is not for beginners. Turkey really is not for beginners. Uh, it's a very complicated place at many, many levels. It has a highly professional diplomacy that has been largely pushed aside. So there's been a kind of deprofessionalization of Turkish policy in different ways. It's a kind of the mercurial behavior of President Erdogan is a part of the equation here. Uh, historical anxieties about the West are part of the equation, but also a sense of the value of things like NATO, that you know this is the place where Turkey has a seat at the table. It's not about to give that up, nor is there a mechanism for forcing them to give it up. So <coughs> Turkey, as always, is a melange of all sorts of very complicated things. But as the neighborhood has become more dangerous, uh, these things are becoming more pointed as questions, I just you know, just finally with Russia, yes, there is this closer relationship with Russia at the level of defense industries and other things, but there are also multiple points of potentially very serious conflict with Russia for Turkey. Uh, it is a mixture in that sense of competition and cooperation. Both, by the way, make the West uncomfortable <laughs> because both increase the vulnerability of NATO allies. Uh, uh, Fernanda, do you want to uh, to uh, to have uh, do you have a take on this, or you want me to uh, to pose a very important and very exciting question? I can't wait for the exciting question. Okay, the exciting <laughs> question is the following: Now that we have this uh, dynamic that was triggered by the Abraham uh, Agreement. I mean, don't you think that this is real? Uh, it, it's a window of opportunities for the United States uh, uh, to, uh, to, to show leadership, to really push this positive dynamic and make something out of this very uh, important and very promising uh, uh, opportunity? That's a very good question, uh, Ambassador. I would like to answer that. And also maybe I can add a very short comment on Latin America as well, since the idea is to give a view of the wider Atlantic. So I think it would be interesting, uh, even because uh, Dr. Lesser just remembered that uh, Brazil and Latin America, I would say, are not for uh, beginners. So <laughs> let me give my two cents of comments to help people abroad to understand what's happening here. So uh, uh, regarding the, the first question, the question about uh, th this moment as an opportunity to the US, uh, I agree on that. But I, I think that uh, for many reasons, people are now making parallels between uh, Joe Biden and FDR. 
one of these reasons uh, uh, is because uh, the the foreign policy that Biden is trying to to develop is very close uh, in terms of values to the Wilsonian internationalism from the FDR period. And if, for one point of view, it can give the U.S. the opportunity to uh, engage and to develop the leadership uh, in this hegemonic transition, we are all uh, testimonious uh, uh, as a way. Uh, by the other hand, it is also an opportunity to other countries to um, react to the American leadership because they understand there is a dogmatism that comes from Washington. And that's why I think in the future, uh, the discussion is related to the dogmatism of Washington versus the pragmatism of Shanghai, for example. So uh, this, this two uh, uh, ways of dealing with foreign policy and uh, aid, etc., I think they are central to understand if and how the U.S. can play uh, this role of leadership. So uh, if I understood it correctly, I would say that, of course, it is an opportunity, but at the same time, uh, many countries, they have a very skeptical way of dealing with the U.S. And it comes when it comes to Latin America specifically, uh, it, it is somehow related to my comment, because in the region uh, here in Latin America, I would say that building trust uh, is and will be Biden's central challenge in the region. Uh, this is because historically, mentions of the Latin American region are very often directly proportional to the perception of security risks uh, that Americans identify for themselves here in the region. That's why they are always talking about uh, uh, transnational challenges, migration, and other subjects. And Joe Biden uh, government in this first uh, months of government uh, the, uh, he's not actually resignifying uh, hemispheric relations uh, in a sub substantial point of view. Uh, the priority agendas uh, are issues that are particularly very sensitive to the countries of the region. They are linked mainly to human rights and to environment. When it comes to human rights, we have a lot of discussions happening in uh, specifically Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. And when it comes to environment, we could uh, uh, highlight the, the role of Mexico, which is very interesting in this uh, uh, topic specifically, and also, of course, Brazil. And at the same time, uh, on the Latin American side, uh, the, the scenario is not very encouraging either because uh, regional integration and coordinations are not going very well. Uh, we have the fragility of national projects uh, making difficult to think about the long-term policies in the region. And we have, of course, a lack of institutional stability and, of course, elite commitment to find, to build, in a significant internal cons consensus. That's why we here in Latin America are very skeptical about how different Biden can be in terms of the legacy he will build in the region. Thank you. Any reaction to what? Yeah, actually, it? Mohammed, I wanted to tackle your point about the uh, Abraham Accords. Um, yes because I think this is a historical development which is underappreciated in some European countries, not everywhere in Europe, but I would say that in France, this has been, I mean, beyond a very small number of people, this has been uh, underappreciated. And I think that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Americans, the Moroccans, the Israelis, and the Emiratis are all going very fast on the, this changing dynamics. and. Uh, the French claim they've always wanted to be involved in this region, and I think they're lagging behind now in, in, in some respect. 
Um, but by the way, more generally about the Middle East and the US administration, I have a motto on this, which is as follows. Um, most US presidents have said over the years, for the past 30 years, that they wanted to leave, leave aside, give more less importance, et cetera, to the Middle East. And each, each and every time they're dragged down to the Middle East in a sense. So each, each and every US president, when coming into office, should have a law played in his or her office that says, you may not be interested in the Middle East, but the Middle East is interested in you because this is usually what happens. So uh, we've seen this before. US presidents say, oh, no, no, no more uh, wars and intervention in the Middle East. And uh, uh, sometimes events, uh, events just drag them back there. But the Abraham Accords is, is really an opportunity for a significant historical change indeed. Ambassador, can I add just a very short comment on the on the specifically the the Abraham Accords? You uh, have a, you have the inalienable rights to intervene <laughs> whenever you want. Okay, it's just a very short comment. I would be very literal on that because sometimes uh, it's it's a very complicated subject. But I would say that the problem, the the most significant problem with the Abra uh, Abraham Accords are related to what I was just mentioning. That is le the legitimacy. Th this is the problem because uh, it is very complicated to establish uh, an agreement as this one without taking uh, the the the. The, the, the in, taking into consideration the interests of a, a, a part, a very sensitive part as the Palestine, for example. So uh, here in Brazil, uh, when we uh, followed the Abraham Accords, all the specialists in the Middle East, they were highlighting that, that uh, of course it is important to uh, build consensus in the region to, tie, to try to uh, put together people uh, to negotiate the subject, but uh, that that are uh, players, important players that were not invited. So this is something I would like to add. Thank you. And if I may just add something to that too, I, I, yes, of I course, it's an important. I, I expect you to. Uh, no, no, no. It's, a, it's an important set of points. I mean, I think you know, it's, it's, it's a fair kind of question to ask just as a thought experiment. If these Abraham Accords had not been put into place, including the aspect with Morocco, um, would the Biden administration have done this? Um, and I, you know, it's, it's reasonable to suggest that they wouldn't actually, that yes, yes, there were st structural things happening in the politics of the region that encouraged this, that's true. Uh, but, you know, the Biden administration on, on, the, on the question, uh, you know, related to, Mor to Morocco, for example, uh, and the Western Sahara, they could have reversed this. There's no treaty obligation there. They could have just as a matter of executive practice just reversed this uh, uh, recognition, but they haven't done so. Uh, I think that's in part a recognition of the importance of Morocco to the, to the country, but it's also, but it's other things. There is a... There is, there is a kind of grudging recognition, probably, that there was something, one of the few things uh, in the foreign policy realm that this administration wanted to inherit from its predecessors. No, I, I honestly, I, I mean, I don't, I didn't want to drag you into the, this discussion, but I, I mean, I, I believe that uh, if, if we see the, uh, the involvement of the United States, most of the time, when there are clashes between Hamas and the and, and and Israel, when we are problems, the United States rush to do something, and really they, they are effective behind the scenes to uh, 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 help to assist the Egyptians, for example, as mediators to achieve something that is quick, and that can deal with the situation. Okay, can I mean the, 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 are we to understand it's that it's only when they have crisis that the United States will, will come to uh, try to solve this crisis. And when they have real, a real opportunity to press both parties, I mean, either Palestinians and Israelis, to say, look, now all the radicals that were, that were against, against peace and cooperation in the Middle East are either weakened or not anymore here. 
okay? You have a dynamic that have been initiated or by, by few, few, few uh, Arab countries. And you have, you have new leadership in, in, in Israel. I mean, you have honestly, you have all the ingredients to try something. That, that, that's 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 my uh, my dilemma so, uh, personally. There's one argument, well, except for one, except for one, a new leadership in Palestine. I mean, many experts of the conflict would tell you that it's difficult to imagine that Abu Mazen okay. would be willing to enter in this kind of conversation today. I mean, not to shift the conversation, but I couldn't help, I couldn't resist saying, except for one ingredient, maybe. Okay, let me have also a quick answer to your answer. Believe me, if you have a real genuine effort from the United States with the help of the European Union, because they are still perceived as the one who can help achieve that, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, lasting peace. If you have commitment from the United States if you have the assistance or cooperation from the European Union, believe me, you will have a very effective and very sudden leadership that will emerge, and you will have the public opinion from the Palestinians and the Israelis that will push for that and will favor that and that we will come there. So sometimes I, I, I think dismissing this possibility and this opportunity because there is a lack of leadership or in sclerosed or whatever you, you can you, you can qualify it is should not be a pretext not to try something. Well, if I, if I may, I mean, as an aspiration, of course, I'm totally with you. Um, I, I think Biden probably, I hear I'm just guessing, would be totally with you. I mean, of course, he lived all of this history, you know. I mean, in, in his life in politics, he was very involved in foreign policy. He saw all of that, both in the good days and in the terrible days of the peace process. Um, you know, I think it would be his inclination in a certain sense any, for any American administration, a comprehensive settlement remains the ultimate diplomatic prize. Uh, I mean, you saw this even in the Trump administration, which was not a highly professional exercise when it came to global diplomacy, forgive me. But, he, but here they were at their most professional in some ways. And, and um, you know, Biden would recognize this, but here I also think you feel the weight of these distractions. You know, the weight of the domestic distractions, the weight of the global distractions with China, um, it gets, you know, you have to put your credibility on the line to invest the, the sort of energy uh, commitment of the president to something like this. Um, and the bar has gotten higher because you have to justify to your populations that you're not spending that time on the health crisis or the economy or a long-term competition with China, or that crisis that's happening next week with Russia, or whatever it may be. I mean, that's the tragedy of it, perhaps. But as far as the aspiration goes, who, who could not you know, share the view, Mohamed? Well, I, I, I forgot one element, uh, that since uh, President Biden is going on to exhaust one mandate for four years, maybe that this, this is a possibility for him to leave a print on a one-term uh, presidency. Well, that's that's a lot. Let's uh, let's let leave this. Uh, 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 I think that for the time being, and according to the press and all what we have heard and read and listened to, uh, 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 as far as United States and China and Russia are concerned, uh, the, the press is talking about there is a, a risk in Asia about China invading Taiwan, and there is a risk from Russia doing something else against Ukraine. These, these are the reports. I mean, what's, what's the take of European and, 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 and United States on this? I hope it's not perspective, I, it's not a hypothesis, but this is something that is that we have read a lot of things about it, even if it's not, uh, we all we all agree that it will not materialize. Okay, mm. I, I'm sort but of there is a risk anyway. There is a risk this because I think in some ways you get more sensible the further away you get from these problems, as a matter of judgment, possibly. I mean, you know, if you ask those in the in Poland or in the Baltic states about this, you're going to get one sort of answer. Uh, if you ask. Um, 
you know, uh, in certain places in Asia, you'll get a different sort of answer. Um, in some ways, the further away you get, the more objective you become. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious how this looks from, you know, the Southern Atlantic. Uh, yeah. I have my view, which is to say, I don't really know. I mean, I, I can see the accumulation of the risk, but the problem happens when things simply go wrong, you know, whether oh, you know, okay. a border guard, border in Poland uh, does something, uh, rules of engagement get ragged, uh, things simply go wrong, they get misinterpreted, whatever. Same thing would happen in the Taiwan Straits. Um, she would like my two cents about it. It's, it's very simple. Neither a military planner nor a U.S. president can afford to think that it will not happen. It's as simple as that. The probability is rather low. Yes. But I will never tell the French president, don't worry, Mr. President, it's not going to happen. It's bad enough so that you have to take into account a slightly increased probability that it, something really bad could happen either around Ukraine or in the Taiwan Strait. If you ask me for my judgment, am I ready to bet money or champagne or whatever on the fact that it would not happen? Yes, I'm ready to bet, but uh, not my whole, uh, not all my possessions of okay. champagne. Yes, uh, right. I would agree with both of them. I would say that, of course, the flows of globalization, the economic dependence, all the very rational criteria, they avoid this possibility of uh, a real conflict. But uh, as both of them said, we agree on this idea that sometimes uh, we can identify, identify the rising provocations, the tensions, and uh, small events, sometimes misinterpret misinterpretation of events, it can be very uh, problematic. So uh, no one would say that we are free of these risks. Okay, thank you. Well, let's 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 move from uh, from hard power to soft power. <laughs> let's see what 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 do you think of the perspective of uh, trade relations between the United States and China? Uh, do you think that the 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 two countries will continue to smoothen their relations and try to uh, get out of this war that uh, uh, dominated uh, the uh, the the president? Uh, uh, U.S. administration, or do you think that we will continue to this kind of uh, cyclical crisis, and at the same time some uh, some uh, 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 tentative uh, uh, actions in order to to find some compromises between the two countries as far as trade is concerned? Well, yeah, I'm not a trade expert, but I'm happy to offer you a view, which is in a, in a sense to bring it back to our earlier discussion, because I, yes, I, I think it's my own sense is that it's very difficult to imagine this decoupling, economic decoupling. I mean, it's simply, you know, it's at the heart of global economic relationships, especially between the United States and China. It's not going to be unraveled anytime soon. On the other hand, it's certainly fraying. And I don't see too much being done to repair that fraying. And that worries me because it has an effect on strategic stability. I mean, it was one thing to ask the kind of questions that Bruno was betting on or not betting on earlier uh, on, against a backdrop of clear economic interdependence, where that's a widely shared perception, if not reality. Today, that's not so clear in many quarters. Uh, there are plenty of people who are prepared to make the argument that this is something we can do without, and that's true in China too. Uh, rightly or wrongly. And under those conditions, it seems to me strategic stability is badly harmed. Uh, but that would be, that's just my non-trade expert take. Okay. I'm happy to, uh, to offer another very simple non-trade expert uh, perspective. Uh, which am really happy which, also to listen to Bruno. Which is very simply that I don't believe that the Biden administration will deliberately do anything in that field which could severely hurt the American middle class. It's a simple, in the name of the broader um, trial sh show of strengths is China. I think he'll be very cautious to not be perceived as doing anything on China that may severely impact 
uh, in an adverse way uh, the the U.S. middle class. So that's my five cents non-expert view. I agree with you, and especially in the light of all the positive indicators of uh, U.S. economy lately in terms of uh, uh, jobs creation, more than five hundred, more than five hundred thousand, uh, and uh, the uh, well, there is this worrying. Uh, a trend of inflation, but I think that this is something that will be contained anyway. Ambassador, I would add just that uh, besides trade and investment, I would say that the future of the bilateral relations between the US and China, of course, uh, depends on technology. All the sensitive subjects are related to technology. Depending mm -hmm. on the way the Chinese will deal with this specific theme, we can have the elevation of pressure or not. Uh, and it impacts communications, uh, 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 infrastructure, uh, all kinds of uh, things we are facing. Now, now in Brazil, for example, we are uh, uh, dealing with the 5G technology. And the 5G technology here is uh, the subject that puts US and China uh, in a in a rival situation, so it's just an example what of what's happening here in my country. But uh, it will be uh, the the reality uh, of the world, even because uh, China is now very interested in this uh, four four point zero uh, technological revolution and made in China twenty twenty five and Belt and Road Initiative, all of that are related to technology. So we cannot avoid discussing technology if we want to understand the future of the relations in trade and investment. Thank you. Thank you, Fernanda. Now, uh, uh, let me raise, I think, maybe for the last seven or eight minutes, but well, not, not even <laughs> a few minutes that we, we are left with. Uh, uh, yes, Biden administration uh, restored, let's say, the logic of uh, uh, negotiations, of diplomacy, of uh, finding compromises, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, uh, I think they have delivered symbolically on so many uh, aspects. Uh, what is left is all the uh, uh, structures that govern international relations, meaning the international organization, whether if it is the reform of the United Nations or the reform of WTO, which is which is which is pending. Uh, do you think that uh, during this uh, first term presidency we can see uh, at least some? thinking from the Biden administration about uh, tackling this very thorny uh, issue of reforms of the uh, institutions of international institutions of governance, uh, beginning by WTO first. I would say that who will have no time and no energy, <laughs> okay. but I'm, I'm not sure. I. I, I, you may, I is no almost, intention is almost the same. I mean, I think they have an inclination. Uh, I think, look, point number one, they actually take these institutions seriously. And I would include here the EU and NATO, of course. I mean, it's not just trade institutions, it's other things, but also the UN, broadly speaking. Um, but to go from that to an active campaign of reform is something else. And there, I think it becomes much more difficult for them, as much as they would be inclined to do it. Um, you know, you see this with the WTO. I mean, they could have moved more rapidly uh, with the WTO, and they haven't. They complained vigorously about the Trump administration's failure to do that, but you don't really see it. And I think it goes back to that point that was made earlier by, you know, by Bruno, especially that uh, you know the sensitivity to, to on, on trade and the middle class, and you know, a sense of to protect, or at least protectionism light. Um, so that kind of goes in the back of the queue. The restoration of alliances is at the front of the queue. Uh, everything else is sort of in between. It's very meaningful for the EU, actually, because here you see a distinct difference. I mean, this administration actually sees the EU as a critical partner, the EU as the EU. 
um, that is a total departure from its predecessor, um, which makes which does in the end of the day make make a difference, I think. And this would go for regional institutions in Latin America or in Africa as well. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I don't have anything further to. I think Fernanda, okay, well, Fernanda I was, nailed it. Uh, she nailed it. I was, so I, I don't have anything to, to I, add. I was I was going to tell you that we went beyond one hour fifteen minutes. It was one hour sixteen minutes. I I'm, uh, uh, but we. I think it's fortunate that we didn't talk about COVID-19 at all. I didn't want to uh, to stress our uh, our audience and my friends. Uh, I wanted to take it from the issue of the uh, of the patent uh, vaccine. Uh, it's uh, this is this is one one issue that is uh, I think uh, 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 analyzed and uh, and discussed uh, worldwide. But uh, maybe it will be for another uh, webinar. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, thank you, Jan, and thank you, Fernanda. Uh, I hope that you will keep safe, and I hope that we will see you very, very shortly uh, in in Marrakesh or in Rabat, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed. Thanks to all. Thank you very thank much. You. Great to be with you. All the thank best. You. Same here. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.